first nuclear power plant disaster in U.S. history happened at Three Mile Island in Middletown, Pennsylvania. For an unsettling week in March of 1979, this dramatic accident held the world's attention as engineers struggled to bring the damaged reactor under control. Why did this accident happen and how did it impact the nuclear industry? Let's take note with Anthony Barada, who was one of the nuclear engineers who worked on the decontamination and recovery project at TMI. He is now Professor Emeritus of Nuclear engineering at Penn State and serves as an administrative law judge with the Atomic and Safety Licensing Board. He is co-author of TMI 25 Years Later, The Three Mile Island Nuclear Power Plant Accident and Its Impact. The book is published by Penn State Press. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. We, we talked, I think, at, at the 10th year anniversary. Here That's we are, 25, we did, yes. 25 <laughs> That's uh, right. after TMI. Mm -hmm. what, what was the impetus for writing a book about 25 years later? Well, over the 25 years, we've had a lot of people ask a lot of questions about TMI as a result of uh, a website that the university has. And we decided, well, maybe the way to address them is to put together a book that tries to answer all those. And that's, that's what we did. Now, you mentioned this website, which is uh, maintained or hosted by the Penn State University Libraries. Right, right. And it includes literally uh, hundreds of uh, written documents and videotapes mm -hmm. Um, of the accident, the recovery, and the cleanup, which is, uh, uh, took a long, long time. The cleanup itself was, mm -hmm. was at least a 10-year process, right. mm -hmm. and you as a, a nuclear engineer were intimately involved mm -hmm. in that. Tell us something about that. Well, the collection itself, uh, Bonnie Yosef and Tom Conklin and I put together and created that, and that was based upon uh, the e effort that was done, as you mentioned, as part of the cleanup, and that involved uh, decontaminating large portions of the reactor building and associated plant systems so that basically people could get in there, make an assessment of the damage, uh, recover the fuel that was there because that was a concern. You didn't want to have this uh, uranium which uh, formed the reactor. He wanted that out of there and shipped to a storage location for safe disposal eventually, as well as trying to eliminate any chance of any radiation or radioactive material getting out of the building and getting into the water and things like that. That was the main objective and to do it safely obviously. Now, the cause of the accident has been traced in part to human error, but of course it was more than that mm -hmm. we know now. Um, tell us what the causes were <laughs> and just how co close mm -hmm. we came mm -hmm. uh, to a China syndrome kind of a meltdown. Mm -hmm. Well, while human error played a major role in the accident, uh, there were issues like poor design of the control room in terms of where instruments were, whether or not the operators could see them. There were questions of inadequate training of the people. Uh, the, there were procedural problems, uh, there were emphasis in the regulatory side on certain types of accidents, and this was a slightly different scenario. Uh, went, you know, throughout the industry, in fact, as a result of it, there's been some major changes, both by the owners and operators, as well as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the industry as a whole. Uh, and this has hopefully led to a, a you know, safer industry, and I think that's indicative of the a number of unplanned events that have occurred that really dramatically declined in the last uh, 10 years or so you know, as a result of the lessons learned. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, nuclear power held a lot mm -hmm. of promise. People looked at it as almost unlimited and, and essentially mm -hmm. a free energy source. How is it looked upon today? Well, actually today, the, the image of nuclear power seems to be a lot more positive than it was, say, 10 years ago. Uh, we're seeing uh, an increased interest in the utility industry about the prospects of maybe building new plants. Uh, if you look at public opinion polls, you'll see there's a positive attitude towards the construction of new plants. And I think probably within the next three to five years, we may very well see a new nuclear power plant built in the United States. And one hasn't been built uh, as far as I understand, for at least 25 years. Yeah, the, actually the last one that was completed was uh, completed during the 1990s, but it had been ordered quite a bit earlier than that. And people are now talking about the possibility of actually finishing some of the plants that were not completed and were mothballed, or as I said, even building new ones. And part of the reason that uh, plants were not finished or built were there were sig very significant cost overruns. Plants were getting up into the tens of billions of dollars uh, price range, and that, that just is not affordable, as well as the regulatory impacts that were occurring. It was just a whole host of reasons. And a lot of those have now been, uh, have disappeared, uh, and there seems to be a clear need for more power, particularly in certain parts of the country, as you're probably aware from the California situation. Now, sociologists say, though, that one of the legacies of TMI is public mistrust. So mm -hmm. I'm a little surprised that yeah. uh, the public perception is that nuclear power mm -hmm. might be okay. Um, 
do does the public think that will it will probably be a safer industry today? I mean, human error. Mm -hmm. um, can can we uh, eliminate the possibility for human error? In, well, in unfortunately, you can never eliminate the possibility of human error, and that, that's one of the primary concerns in any any high tech industry, in the airline industry, whatever. And uh, what's been done, though, is an attempt has been made to have uh, additional safety features, both uh, procedural as well as actual hardwired type things uh, in the plants and such. And again, looking at what has happened, uh, the the events which are not accidents but uh, unexpected occurrences and such those have dramatically declined. I think that's part of the public's shift in their attitude, that uh, generally when you ask someone, do they favor nuclear power, yeah, they say yes, but as long as it can be safely done. And I think the industry, in order to continue to gain that trust, has to demonstrate that. Now let's get back to that date, March 28, 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvanians and, and really those living within uh, a, a small radius near Harrisburg were the first to hear mm -hmm. about this at 8.25 a.m. when a Harrisburg radio station, WKBO, first announced mm -hmm. that there was a general emergency. Tell us a little bit about how the media um, got the word out. Well, the, the media was uh, pretty quickly jumped on. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I know even the local radio stations and television stations around here uh, picked up on it by the six o'clock news that evening. And there was terrific coverage over the next few uh, days uh, as the accident progressed and concerns grew about the you know, possibility of evacuation and such. But it wasn't like today. I mean, we, we didn't have the 24 seven CNN and other types of coverage that we see today. Uh, so you pretty much had to wait till the news events occurred or there was you know, some sort of bulletin and such. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think the media was really prepared to deal with it in part because they didn't have the scientific knowledge right. that they needed yes. to report on mm -hmm. something like this. Yeah. And I think that has changed significantly thanks to things like you know, WPSX and such. I think that's uh, we've greatly improved the scientific reporting and such uh, of events like that. Now, two days after the incident, there there were concerns that there was a, a hydrogen bubble mm -hmm. that could result right. in, in an explosion. Mm -hmm. That turned out not to be the case. But if you look at, uh, back at the coverage that took place in that at least that first week, mm -hmm. how accurate or inaccurate was it? Uh, I, it was not accurate in the sense of what was actually happening, but then I think there was a, also a big problem with communications between the different parties involved, the, the federal agencies, the uh, owner, operator, and the news media. I mean, I, I personally worked with, uh, a year or so later, with a lot of the news media. It was very clear that uh, one of the big problems was just trying to communicate the ideas in a consistent and uh, understandable manner. I mean, we, as engineers, tend to use a lot of jargon. <laughs> Um, governor Thornburg, who of course was governor at the time, advised that the 3,500 mm -hmm. pregnant women and preschool aged right. children evacuate the area. When it was all said and done, uh, some 200,000 people fled their homes at least for a mm -hmm. couple of days. And, and most report that that was actually a pretty smooth evacuation as evacuations mm -hmm. uh, go. What do we know now, though, 25 years later, in terms of what risk or what hazard those women and children, and everyone else mm -hmm. for that matter, uh, were exposed to? Well, really, <coughs> they were probably exposed posed to far more risk because they evacuated than had they stayed there because the uh, the actual radiological concerns were really minimal. Uh, in fact, if, uh, you, if you lived in Denver, Colorado, you got more radiation than living in <coughs> Middletown during the accident, actually. When you say in Nevada, you mean the radiation, the natural occurring right, radiation? Right, natural background radiation, just because you're a higher elevation and such. Uh, and the risk that people experience because of driving. I, one woman said you know, afterwards when I spoke to her, you know, after I realized I'd done this, driven 50 miles away and almost got an automobile accident, I probably would be better staying there. So. Compare this, if you would, to what's considered the world's worst mm -hmm. nuclear power plant disaster, which of course was uh, Chernobyl in the USSR, which is now the Ukraine, back in April of 1986. The, uh, Chernobyl accident was far more severe because they did not have many of the safety features, primarily the containment building, the big, thick concrete building that surrounds the reactor. And as a result, there were extremely large areas that were uh, pretty well contaminated by the uh, fire and explosion that occurred. And as you know, there were uh, quite a few firefighters who were killed as a result of that. Now, the cleanup of TMI actually took 
10 years. Mm -hmm. And if I recall, um, the contaminated uh, uh, water was actually evaporated mm -hmm. slowly into mm -hmm. the atmosphere. When it was all said and done, um, the cleanup was uh, over a billion dollars. Are we still paying for that today? I think in a way we are. I think that uh, the, the cost uh, is, has been rolled into uh, many different charges, both uh, with the state's effect and also by the utilities and such. Plus, all the safety features that were added afterwards obviously get folded into the bills and such. Now, how soon after the accident did you actually step foot into the facility? Uh, about a year later, when they started to get serious about cleaning it up and trying to figure out what was going to what was going to be involved and such, I became pretty heavily involved from that point on for about the ten years that it took. Now, uh, currently, about twenty one percent of our electricity is generated by nuclear mm -hmm. power. Uh, as uh, America's uh, need for fuel, it, it isn't getting any smaller. Mm -hmm. um, how, how important a role do you think it will play realistically in, mm -hmm. in the coming years? Uh, the estimates are with uh, the renewed licenses that the plants are getting, that it'll continue to be a significant part of the electric power generation within the United States, at least for the next 10 years or so. And if new plants are built, then it could actually increase the amount of uh, electricity the percentage was that, that is generated by nuclear. Well, what's interesting is that this, for, for anyone uh, our age, this is something that, that we have an <laughs> indelible mark in our mm -hmm. memories about this particular date, but for uh, current college students, this is something uh, they're probably not that aware of, and I'm, I'm wondering uh, how important you think this this pivotal day in our mm -hmm. minds uh, is to the rest of Pennsylvania yeah. and, and the U.S. Well, I, th I think it's it's important in that it it does remind us that any technology, no matter how safe we try to make it, there is some risk in it, and we have to weigh the benefits versus the risk of, of using that technology. Uh, we look at genetic engineering nowadays as an issue like that. All right. Well, thanks so much, and good luck with your book. We've been talking with Anthony Barada. He is a nuclear engineer. His new book is TMI, 25 Years Later. The book is published by Penn State Press. If you have story ideas for Take Note, we'd love to hear from you. Send them to Take Note. That's Wagner Annex, University Park, Pennsylvania, 16802. For Take Note, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.